Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and today I'm going to be watching Spider-Man 2 to talk about all the engineering scenes in the movie. Who do we have here? This is my good friend I called you about, the guy who got me through high school science. Peter Parker, sir. Parker? I'm writing a paper on you for Yes, a... yes, I know what you're doing here, but I really don't have time to talk to students right now. <clears throat> But Oscorp pays the bills, so. That's right. That's why I have to take off, board meeting. But my job is done here. Got you two geniuses together. Good luck tomorrow, Otto. Nobel Prize. <laughs> we'll see you in Sweden. Engineering and STEM professors in general don't care about their students. They really don't have an incentive to make sure that, that the students that they're explaining these concepts to actually understand the concepts or know what's going on. I mean, they don't actually get any more funding or anything out of it to make sure that their students actually learn. When it comes to research though, professors are looking for sponsors all the time to make sure that they receive funding to continue whatever they're doing to stay at this university. And when you're being sponsored by someone like Oscorp and they ask you to do a favor, you will do the favor. <laughs> I mean, if you're asking for someone for all this money and they ask you to meet somebody else, even though it's outside of your time frame, you will do it. Is that it? Yes. My design to initiate and sustain fusion. Well, I understand you use harmonics of atomic frequencies. Sympathetic frequencies. Harmonic reinforcement? Go on. An exponential increase in energy output. A huge amount of energy. Like a perpetual sun providing renewable power for the whole world. He got that part right. The, our sun, and in fact I think a few of them, if not all of them, are actually undergoing nuclear fission and fusion at the same time. Sympathetic frequencies just means the same frequency on two different objects. If you take a tuning fork that's vibrating at 300 hertz and you move it to another tuning fork that's stationary not vibrating at all without touching them just having them next to each other they'll both begin to vibrate at 300 hertz and when this happens both of these objects have achieved sympathetic resonance every atom has a resonance frequency and if you can match that frequency with magnetic or sound waves you'll destabilize the atoms in question it's kind of like whenever somebody reaches a really high note and they can like shatter a wine glass in this case, what he's doing is he's using this idea of sympathetic resonance that those like metal, uh, pretty much that cage is creating these magnetic waves at certain frequencies that's going to upset whatever he's using for the fusion reaction to initiate fusion, which is usually uh, tritium or didurium. It's, it's pretty much like a different variation of an isotope of hydrogen. These four actuators were developed and programmed for the sole purpose of creating successful fusion. They are impervious to heat and magnetism. If he could build a device that was impervious to heat and magnetism, that's the Nobel Prize right there. <laughs> the fusion react reactor is just completely extra at that point. There is no such material that we know of on Earth that's impervious to heat and magnetism. I can't even think of one that's impervious to either of them. What we know from the thing that he built, all the materials that are a part of those mechanical arms were from metals that are on Earth, and we know the melting points of all of those. So even when you make a really, really powerful alloy, we can still calculate the melting point of that new metal. So well, whenever he used to build that, it must have come from outer space. But even in the Marvel Universe, vibranium and adamantium are both impervious to magnetism as well as heat. We know from Black Panther that the trains in Wakanda were moving using magnetism. So vibranium is affected by it and we know that Magneto can control Wolverine because he has that adamantium coating on his skeleton. So whatever metal he, um, Octavius is using has got to be the most powerful substance that we've ever seen. These smart arms are controlled by my brain through a neural link. Nanowires feed directly into my cerebellum, allowing me to use these arms to control fusion reaction in an environment no human hand could enter. If someone were to lose an arm, for example, like just from their shoulder down, your brain still thinks that the arm exists, like depending on the age at which you lost it, but your neural connections there are still very much alive. So there is prosthetic technology that is built to enhance these signals that your neurons are sending to the arm that no longer exists. So when you have a prosthetic limb, 
you can actually move all five fingers as if the plastic arm was your own from the beginning. I'm not sure how he's able to move those four individual arms because those don't naturally exist on any human being. So I don't know how his brain is able to comprehend how these arms can even move. Even though there was a uh, microchip that he implanted, I don't know, like how would you program that so that your brain could think to move these arms individually? That would be one hell of an engineering challenge. Why are the arms on his back? Like I feel like they'd be more efficient if he just put them like on that like oval uh, sort of cage that can control the fusion reaction. Like why would you put them on your spine and then you individually move those like it would be much better if you had a robot do it or something that was automated so that this fusion reaction can continue on forever because it's not like when you start the reaction that he's gonna be there 24 7 to make sure that it's stabilized which is really just another example of how engineers are much smarter than physicists in a fusion reaction the temperature required to actually achieve that is so incredibly high and the containment field that he built doesn't actually have any walls that that contain this heat as that that we can see so with his human body being that close that the arms can actually impact the reaction he, he would die from the heat very very quickly before those arms were of any sort of use at all the last question i have about these arms are how is he powering them i mean they've got to be battery powered arms otherwise because he's not just walking around with something plugged into him at all times but Where's the power source for these arms? <laughs> I mean, in Iron Man, we know where the power source of his suit is. It's his arc reactor. But in this case, we don't actually know where the mechanical or electrical energy is coming from that these arms can move. Precious tritium is the fuel that makes this project go. There's only 25 pounds of it on the whole planet. There, there's way more than 25 pounds of tritium. I mean, not, not naturally occurring, um, but we can artificially create pretty much as much tritium as we want to. Normally, hydrogen just as itself is one proton and one electron, but when you add more neutrons, you're not actually changing the element, you're just making it more unstable. So tritium, hence three, has one proton and two neutrons inside of its nucleus. That's why it's called tritium. That is one of the key elements in fusion. The other one is, I think it's called deuterium, uh, but that is hydrogen with one extra neutron. Nuclear fusion requires a very high amount of energy and a very high amount of pressure to actually initiate and maintain. And the amount of energy that you would produce from this reaction is actually less than what it would take for you to start it. So it's like taking one step forward and two steps back. Fusion as it is right now is not cost effective. Like it's actually costing you more to do it than you are getting out of it. So that's why we're not doing it now. Fasten your seatbelts. We have a successful fusion reaction. When you do end up having a successful fusion reaction, you won't actually create a mini sun. It will just be a really bright ring of light. From where we are on Earth, if you just stare at the sun in the sky long enough, you can't actually burn out your retinas and lose vision. So from where they are, which is like 10 feet from a little mini sun, it's going to be so bright to the point where even the person wearing those safety eye goggles will go blind. How did he get electrocuted? The arms are impervious to magnetism. That that shouldn't have happened. Overall, it wasn't the most scientific accurate movie that I've seen, but we're not watching this movie for scientific accuracy. You're watching it for Spider-Man. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you want me to watch and comment on, put it in the comments. Thank you for watching. Stay fresh. Stay golden.